My name is Amanda Sheely, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Social Policy at LSC. My research looks at the relationship between women and different government systems, uh, mainly focused in the United States. Uh, so this is related to inequality because uh, many of these systems, so I look at economically disadvantaged mothers, um, and what's interesting is that these systems were really set up to provide extra help and support um, to these mothers, but actually how they interact with these systems and the type of assistance that they get can fundamentally reproduce inequalities. For example, if you look within the social assistance or welfare system, over time this has shifted from providing families financial support to shifting to get them into the workforce. And so if this is working well, then you can see that they have a good relationship with the case manager. They might have access to training for their training, for their education, as well as any other supports that they need, like childcare. But the way that the system has actually worked um, is that the case management is more tick boxy. And actually, instead of being a form of care, it's more seen as coercion. And so women are pushed into the low wage labor market in jobs that might not be suited for their need, that are pretty low quality. And so um, instead of getting them off of government benefits, which they were never really dependent on government benefits before, you just see this perpetuation of a cycle between welfare and benefits and welfare and benefits. So that's that's the social assistance system. Um, and the criminal justice system is the same way. So in the United States, there's a huge focus on incarceration, which is terrible. Incarceration is a terrible thing. Uh, but if you look at statistics, incarceration is actually just a teeny portion, it's a really small portion of the criminal justice system. So most people who are in the criminal justice system are on probation or parole or community supervision. And so this is another system where, again, you're supposed to get extra care, extra support in a way that will help you get into the labor market um, and stay out of the criminal justice system. Uh, but what a lot of research has found is that actually, once again, instead of providing care, that system acts more like coercion and people feel punished by it. Um, so it perpetuates these a lot of the negative outcomes that it's actually seeking to, to control. The most recent publication that I had uh, started with in 1996, welfare reform was passed in the United States. And so the goal of this legislation was to really uh, take a system that just provided financial assistance to poor mothers and instead set up this work, this work system, a work that would actively put, push them into work. Um, as part, one little provision of this legislation was also the United States government said, if you have a drug felony conviction, then we're not gonna allow you to get financial assistance through two programs. So one was the financial assistance program for poor mothers, uh, and the other one is a nutritional assistance program. But because it's the United States and the federal government actually doesn't really like to tell states what to do, they said, that's okay, you can opt out of this, right? So at any time, if you want to, just pass legislation and you can decide what to do about it. So in this project, one of the things that I did was say, okay, so let's see what's going on with this. Um, and so over time, what I found was that so especially for the state, the, pro the program that provides financial assistance to families, fewer states actually, there's only a handful of states that say no, drug people with drug felony convictions can never get nutritional assistance. So that's not there. You see an increase in states that say, we don't care, you can get nutritional assistance regardless of if you have a, a drug felony. But the most interesting one and, and th what most states have done is said, yes, but. And the yes, but is a whole bunch of supervisory requirements. So for example, you need to comply with probation and parole. You need to undergo random drug testing. You need to go through drug treatment programs. So you have these yes, but states. So I thought, okay, this yes, but category is really fascinating actually, because again, if you have somebody with a drug felony conviction, you could see how asking them to um, engage in drug treatment would actually be a good thing, right? Um, but instead what I found was uh, I tied it to poverty. And what you found was that the states that said, no, you can't, that people with drug felony convictions can never get financial assistance. The likelihood that people with drug convictions in that state would have would experience poverty was about 40%. And in states where they took it away and said, we don't care, you can always have access to um, financial assistance, it was 20%, right? So, so there you're like, okay, well, yeah, letting them do financial assistance. But in the yes, but states, again, you would think, well, you're giving them more services, so you should do better than states where you just give away money, right? And that wasn't actually true. 
So there was actually no difference between states that said never, statistically significant difference between states that said never and those that said yes, but. So I had an interesting path. So I started off as a social worker in the United States um, and I was dealing with people who primarily had severe and chronic mental illness um, and were homeless and living in a lovely part of Los Angeles known as Skid Row, uh, which was aptly named. And I worked with homeless families. And through this interaction with homeless families, I really noticed that, again, they were just really lacking support that they needed. And so I switched from providing mental health services to becoming a legal advocate. And I worked in welfare offices. So every morning I would train a group of law students uh, about welfare regulations, which was fascinating. And then in the afternoon, we would go into a welfare office and I would say, hi, I'm Amanda, I'm here with Legal Aid, who needs help getting their welfare benefits? And I did this for a few months. Um, and there were a few things that I noticed. And so when I was in those offices, again, I noticed that when you look on the books, what was supposed to be happening in these offices is that people were supposed to be meeting with their case managers, right? <laughs> and and, uh, and getting all of this support. But what it really was, was sitting in a bunch of uh, very ugly linoleum, uh, really dismal offices with a television blaring news all the time, um, vending machines that never worked, and you would spend hours in those welfare offices. And if people missed these appointments, then their benefits would be taken away. And so instead of being something that was really nice and helpful, um, spending months in these offices really showed me how terrible uh, it could be. And so what I would see is this, is this um, pattern where people would like, for example, not pay a parking ticket because they didn't have the money to pay the parking ticket and they would ignore it. And then the, they would, these fees would accumulate and then after a while it would go in front of a judge and the judge would say, you haven't paid a parking ticket and the person also wouldn't show up for court. And then the person would have a warrant out for their arrest. Um, and so then when they would apply for a job, they had this little, you know, they had, a they had a criminal record, but it wasn't incarceration. It wasn't doing anything terrible. It was this little thing that accumulated over time. And so it wasn't just parking tickets. We also saw this with traffic violations. We also saw this with littering. We also saw this with just, again, these little things that really accumulated over time. Um, and so I really became more and more fascinated about the interaction between the welfare system and the criminal justice system. So that was the shift um, again, of not only looking at welfare, but how welfare and criminal justice systems interact, and especially a focus on low, lower levels of criminal justice interaction, not, not incarceration. I actually hope that my research is useful to advocacy groups in a couple of ways. Um, and so one is that uh, is that I think it actually talks to the experiences of people in the system more than just theory. Um, so there's always a theoretical side to my research, but I also wanted to have pretty practical um, applications. And also, I think what's interesting is, especially if you start looking, not, not so much in the European context, but in the US context, a lot of the research around welfare systems for a long time was around personal barriers. And you also see this in the criminal justice system. So when you talk about women, you talk about histories of abuse, you talk about substance abuse issues um, and lack of education. And so it, it takes the problems and individualizes them. And one of the things that I really want to do in my research is bring systems in and how systems can help, but can also be really problematic for people who have this background.